Uh, we are going to go ahead and get started for this morning. And um, so let me make sure everything's running properly. Looks like it is. Okay, well, uh, it's good to see everybody back out here this morning for uh, lesson 109. 109 lessons um, and counting at this point. Uh, but uh, I do want to uh, just make a just a quick announcement. We have a guest with us, uh, Doctor Doctor Dale Dewitt is with us this morning. He's been uh, in town uh, doing research on a O'Hare article on for the 1940s at Baltimore Library for the last few weeks. And he called me yesterday, and I had asked for an article, and he found it and uh, brought it to church and said he wanted to come and visit and uh, hear another lesson. Um, so it's actually a very a very fortuitous occasion for him to be here this morning because the lesson is entitled Correcting the O'Hareism Chronology and he was very much involved with uh, helping me work through some of the early thinking uh, regarding this and uh, as we'll, we'll lay it out here this morning uh, for you to see. So without any further delay I just want to get right into the notes and look at the first couple points for the introduction slash review. Now, if you remember back to uh, <coughs> Lessons 91 and 92, which was in the last term of the class, we talked about the attack on O'Hare um, that surfaced in the O'Hareism under the searchlight of the word pamphlet that was written by Haggai and produced, or printed and distributed and circulated by David Otis Fuller. And if you recall those early lessons, I said to you that I thought that the original publication date of this was 1930, and that, that's when it first appeared. Well, turns out that wasn't right. And so what I want to do this morning is correct that chronology and set <coughs> things, uh, do my best to try to set things in order. But before we do that, I want to remind you of a couple things. So point number two, our original, our original sources for a publication date of 1930 were the entry uh, for O'Hareism on Google Books. If you recall, if you go back to those lessons, I made a point to talk to you about the Google Books entry that had a copyright date of 1930. Then as I was researching things further, I ran across this uh, PhD uh, dissertation by a guy named Adam Christmas, and he, he had a, the same date of 1930 in his PhD for the publication of O'Hareism. So I reason then, as I say there in the notes, that if Christmas said in his Ph.D. that the booklet dated from 1930, then he must have possessed a clearly dated copy or else he would not have risked making such an error in his dissertation. So that, that, that seemed like a reasonable assumption, that if he is going to say in his Ph.D. that it was written in 1930, that he, he must have known that it was, otherwise he wouldn't have said that it was. And then when I saw the Google book entry of the same date, well, I thought that was confirmation of that date, but what, uh, what we now believe, when I say we, I mean myself and uh, Dr. DeWitt, is that Christmas got his date from Google Books. It's probably, the, uh, the, the, probably what happened. Uh, but I'll say more about that in later. Working from the premise that Google Books slash Christmas was correct with respect to the publication date, we also observe curious discrepancies between the quotations of O'Hare's, the great blunder of the church, found in Haggai's O'Hareism. Namely, none of the page numbers match our copies. And when I say our copies, in this case, I mean mine and uh, Mike Merrick's. So the page numbers didn't match, and Haggai's quotations of O'Hare could not be found. You, you might remember this, that um, Mike went over to uh, Puritan Theological Seminary over across the street, over by uh, Cornerstone, and, and we thought that we had located a first edition of O'Hareism because I th this led me to believe that O'Hare had revised the great blunder of the church and he went and looked and I called Dallas Theological Seminary and then it ended up that Dr. DeWitt found a first edition in a box in the, in the basement of Bol uh, Baltimore Library. So we had, we had two things going there early on. Number one, we thought I was working with the assumption that, that Christmas was right in his PhD. Okay. Then the next thing I observed was discrepancies in page numbers and an inability to find the quotations. The stuff that Haggai was quoting in O'Hareism, I could not find in the copy of the great blunder of the church that I had and that Mike had. So then that led me to think that he, O'Hare, had rewritten it. 
So as I say in that last sentence there, this led me to believe that O'Hare must have later, for some unexplained or unknown reason, rewritten the great blunder of the church. So in February 2013, when lessons 91 and 92 were taught, we surmised that the copies of O'Hareism in our possession, that would have been these two right here, this red one that is unmarked, and this uh, navy blue or black one that's marked second edition, these were the two that, that we had via uh, Mike, in our possession, um, we surmise that the copies of O'Hareism in our position, possession were later editions, <coughs> second or later, because they made reference to the passing of the late president of Moody Bible Institute and editor of Moody Monthly, Dr. James M. Gray. Gray, however, did not die until September 21, 1935. This, of course, meant that if Christmas was correct in his dissertation, we possess a later edition. So I'm trying to remind you of the thinking that we had at that that I had at that time. Okay, so I was assuming that Christmas was right. Then I began to observe these discrepancies between the page number, the quotation, and the fact that within the the two editions of O'Hareism that I had in my possession, they make reference to the death of James M. James Gray, which we know didn't happen until September 1935. So if you look at the next point, it was Dr. Dale DeWitt who first questioned whether or not Adam Christmas was correct. At first, I supported the chronology that I had presented in class when speaking with Dr. DeWitt. As studies progressed, however, things were not lining up, and Dr. DeWitt asked me again if I had any other proof for a 1930 publication date beyond Google Books and Christmas, the Christmas PhD. I did not. Would you want to add anything to that? Um, am I remembering all that the way you do? Uh, no, no, no corrections for sure, but um, there was another website <clears throat> that also had the, the 1930 date, which is WorldCat, yes. which is a, a worldwide catalog of, of all publications and everything ever published, uh, and they have the same date. I've written to Google and about this error, and they don't respond. So I don't know where we go from here on that. Okay. So, but, but so that's what happened. I, he he was the one. Doctor Dewitt was the one that first sort of say, "Wait a minute, you know, um, do you have any proof that this actually was written in 1930 beyond the Google Books and the PhD by Christmas?" And I and I didn't. So if you look at the last point. This prompted Dr. DeWitt, should say probably and I, to embark on a full-scale reevaluation of the O'Hareism chronology. What follows is the result of this joint effort to set the record straight. The original chronology presented in lessons 91 and 92 was not correct. Here is our best reconstruction to date of what actually happened. Okay, so that brings you to page two. So, yeah, th there was some. Um, Definitely a lack of clarity when it comes to this when we first went through this. And I thought it was significant enough that we spend the lesson sort of setting things straight with respect to uh, the publication here and what actually took place. So if you look at page two, uh, revised O'Hareism chronology, and you'll see that at the center it says the historical uh, chronological context of the pamphlet of O'Hareism by Dale S. DeWitt and Brian C. Roth. So Dr. DeWitt worked this up. And then I've just <coughs> taken it, uh, put bullet points, added bullet points and so forth so that everything would read the would standard with the notes I've been giving you. And I've added just a couple quotations and, and things to um, uh, just prove further what, what we're trying to communicate. So if you look with me at the, the paragraph there, this chronology questions the 1930 date for the original edition of O'Hareism. The most puzzling element in assigning a 1930 date to the original edition of O'Hare's is O'Hare's apparent long silence about it. Usually he replied to attacks rather promptly, as with James N. Gray and Harry Ironside, and later David Otis Fuller. So one of the things that Dr. DeWitt was, was, was noticing was that if the 1930 date was true, then there was a very long time period between when the thing was first published and when O'Hare responds. And what we had already seen is that there, if O'Hare was aware of a criticism, he would almost immediately respond within you know, a relatively short period of time. And so this wasn't matching the pattern. 
And so with it not matching the pattern, and with there not being good evidence outside of Google Books and the Christmas PhD that it actually came from 1930, that's sort of what prompted a reevaluation. So a date, a 1930 date for the original edition requires a 14-year gap before the second edition appeared. This seems impossible in the light of Fuller's zeal in promoting and distributing the, the pamphlet. This chronology is a proposed new reconstruction based on references in O'Hare's Accuser of the Brethren, Judge David Otis Fuller, and on U.S. Census sheets and city directories to the extent available from the, from the era as a guide to Haggai's movements and locations. It is tentative and subject to further improvements if we find new data. Now, Dr. DeWitt, do you use Ancestry.com, I believe? I do. For some I of this? I have a subscription to it. Okay. So, let's just go through the points. Some of these will be just pretty straightforward. <clears throat> 1922 to 24, Haggai hey marries uh, Mildred Steer in Grand Rapids, Michigan. 1930, the U.S. Census has Haggai living in Kalamazoo, Michigan, and pastoring a Baptist church. Now that's, that's your first clue right there, because <clears throat> both these booklets have Haggai on the cover as the pastor of Brookville Baptist Church in Brook, Brookville, Massachusetts. The U.S. Census has him living in Kalamazoo, Michigan in 1930. So, I mean, that... That right there pretty much tells you that he, it, it couldn't have been written in 1930 because he wasn't living in, in, uh, in, in Massachusetts in 1930. He was living in Kalamazoo. Th 1932 to 34, the Haggai moves to Gossets, did I say that? Gossets Ford, Pennsylvania, according to the U.S. Census sheet. And Goss Gossets Ford mentioned in the 1940 U.S. Census sheet as Haggai's residence in 1935. It is not on recent road maps. Uh, if on the Susquehanna, sorry, Susquehanna. Susque, Susquehanna. Susquehanna River in Pennsylvania, across the state line from Bing, Binghamton, New York, Haggai might have lived there for a short time while pastoring Calvary Baptist Church in Binghamton a first time. He later pastored this church in the late 1940s and early 1950s. See, uh, see below. 1934, David Otis Fuller takes the pastorate of Wealthy Street Baptist Church in Grand Rapids, Michigan. The question that still we don't know is, did Fuller and Haggai know each other before this? So before, hey, before David Otis Fuller becomes pastor at the Wealthy Street Church, does he know Haggai before that? We, we, we don't know. 1936, now this is where things sort of start to get more interesting. Haggai hey moves from Gossett's Ford, Pennsylvania, to Holbrook, Massachusetts, to pastor Brookville Baptist Church. So that's in 1936. He was pastoring here when the unnumbered red type cover edition of O'Hareism was published, as stated on the cover of that edition. See below on 1940. After this time, uh, Fuller began an increased began or increased his public discussion of O'Hare's non-water baptism views. So we now believe that this red one that is unmarked, and when I say unmarked, I mean this one is marked second edition. This one doesn't have anything written on it as far as an edition. There's evidence to believe that subsequent editions were marked second, third, fourth, and so on based on what we've uh, been able to uncover. And this one has him in Massachusetts as the pastor of the church when it's printed. And according to the United States Census data, he moves there in 1936. Okay, so it's pretty clear that the original, my original date of 1930 was, was not correct. Any questions or comments before we go any further? We'll go around me, Pastor Lee, and then Dr. DeWitt. Well, this may be what Dr. Wood is going to say. 1936 with a C beside it means circa 1936. Yeah, roughly. And it, that, the only thing that's provable from Ancestry.com would be that it was after the 1935 date that he stated in the 1940 census. Right. 
And so it could be any time after that. But it's at least and it's at least before you that. next find him in the census. Right. So nineteen thirty is out. Right. Pretty clearly, best belief. Thirty years ago, I spent considerable time with Dr. Fuller, and uh, he told me that that judge, he's not a judge. That was sarcasm from yeah. O'Hare. <laughs> he was uh, simply making fun of him because he was he was considering o, uh, Otis, Otis Fuller as judging him. So he, that's, so I noticed you called him up there, Judge Otis Fuller, but he was not a judge. Well, that's this booklet right here. Judge David Otis Fuller concerning O'Hareism. That, that, that's, that was sarcasm. That's the title. Uh, Dr. DeWitt and I actually had a discussion about whether or not he ever was a judge. And I think we both came to the conclusion that he's sort of being yeah, it was a, that was his own words. Sarcastic. I spent time with him and I asked him about that. Well, O'Hare was sort of a joker. Uh, he was a very jovial man, and he often used titles as jokes, uh, or made used frivolous titles uh, just to get some lightness into the discussion. Uh, so maybe that's. You know, that's in line with his personality, generally. Um, I want to ask you, this is, it has to be speculative, I'm sure, at this point, but that red, red print on that first edition, what do you make of that? Anything? The rest of the, the, the further, all the other five editions, or at least four more, use black or blue ink. I, I wonder if that's, if that's a kind of a warning signal yeah, I don't. I, I hadn't really thought about it. Something I like railroad, railroad signals in red. Could be. Watch I, out, in other words. Maybe. I, yeah, I hadn't really thought about that, Beverly. Well, it could simply be showing that it was the second edition, and it was. If you picked it up as compared to the first edition, you'd know right away it was the second edition just because of the color. That's a possibility too. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, that's. The thing is, they're completely, everything about them is completely identical. <coughs> Every, the paging, the everything, the, the typeface, the set, everything. The only difference is that this says second edition. That's the only... Oh, the red is the original? The red is the original. We oh. believe the red is the original, oh, okay. and the navy or black, it's hard to tell now, it's so faded, is the, is the second. Yeah. Okay. So you're saying that the text never was modified? The text... We no, used we, to think it had been. Right. No. The, the text of this booklet never was modified according to what we, according to. I went, to, I went through that page by page. I, and I did too. When, when Mike gave it to me, I, re, I laid these down, I set them out, and I looked every page, every word, every single thing was exactly identical. The only difference was that one said second edition. But back then, we still believed there had to have been an edition prior to that red one because... The quotes don't match, so we've never found anything that matches. No, the we have. No, that's a good, good, good point of clarification. Yes, we have. We have proved now that O'Hare did rewrite the Great Blunder of the Church. Mm -hmm. That there is a first edition that is from 1929, and that sometime in the latter half of the 1930s he redid it. Okay. Um, for, and it doesn't say any reason why he redid it. He just completely, the pages are different. It's, it's, a, it's almost a totally different book. Um, I don't want to overstate that, but it's shortened. The, the original one was 80 pages. The, the, the second one is 70 pages. And it's very different than the first one. Yeah. Normally, when you see the word edition, you assume that some changes have occurred in that printing. So they, they actually misused the term edition. It really edition. should have been labeled second printing or something that's like that. That's what's throwing us off. That's, that's yeah, th this should have been second printing. But with O'Hare, a great blunder, that truly was a second edition. He truly was, well, yeah. virtually rewrote the whole thing. Yeah. Yes. Or then what may have happened is if the Red Book also really is a second edition and they didn't note it on there, maybe by the time they printed another batch, someone had called them to task for not having 
Could, could be. That happens. I don't know. The, the subsequent editions are all labeled second, third, fourth, or fifth. Third, oh, fourth. even if they're just a reprint? Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. Okay. Let's use the word so that's, okay. that's why we believe the red one is the the first one. The first because one, but not really the first edition. Yeah, you're, he's right. It, it, they should have been labeled second printing or something like that, not yeah. edition. Yeah. But to answer your question, yes, we do know for sure that O'Hare totally rewrote the great blunder of the church. Okay? okay. Now that still, I still have questions about that myself. Okay. Because if you look at when he rewrites it, which I believe to be sometime in the late, mm -hmm. night, late 37, early 38, somewhere in there is when he redoes it. And wh where we're going to see that this comes into existence is, is slightly after that or, or generally uh, around the same time. Okay, um, I, I, I can't, my original thought was that O'Hare rewrote the great blunder of the church in response to this. I no longer think that was true either. I think he just redoes it, maybe because he's he's now changed his mind with respect to dispensational teaching. I don't know, and he never says, and I don't know if we're ever going to know. But I, I used to think that when, with that old chronology that I taught in Lesson 91 and 92, that when this was first printed, what, that it prompted O'Hare to rewrite the great blunder of the church. Now the, the dating and the timing is not, is not lining up. And it would seem, Ronnie, that when this is finally written, they're actually using the older edition of the great blunder of the church at the time this is written because the newer one is already in print and being circulated. Okay? So there's, some, there's still some questions about this that, you know, I don't know that we have the, the, the total answer for. Yeah. Um, since those are moved out closer to 1940, I'm wondering if the difference in the print could have been that the red one was printed before World War II, and that then, because they, they rationed all kinds of things during World War II, that then they shifted to the black. Yeah, that, that, that could be a factor. Yeah. Did you have anything you want to? Okay. So, point 1937-1938. O'Hare writes Fuller in his board a letter, then prints it without a cover on white paper and distributes it under the title, A Letter to Reverend David Otis Fuller. That's this letter right here. Okay? It's on, you know, eight and a half by eleven. It's, it, it's rather lengthy. You open it up, and, this is, and it says right at the top, A Letter to Reverend David Otis Fuller. If you were around when... Uh, Jerry Halston was in town at the end of July. He had these available, and I, I think some of you might have, might have picked these up. But this is a significant letter in establishing the, the, the chronology here that we're looking at. The publication date of 1937 is close to exact. In the letter, O'Hare refers to his conversion to Christ 37 years earlier. And we know that his conversion was in 1899 from his own testimony at the end of December. <coughs> the occasion of this letter was a, ser was a sermon or series on O'Hareism made, sh made shortly into one or more articles in the Grand Rapids Press. Fuller soon began or continued discussion about making a pamphlet on his O'Hareism material with his friend W.A. Haggai under the same title. Apparently Fuller proposed that Haggai write or edit the pamphlet while Fuller would see to its printing and promotion. This discussion was, this discussion was the origin of the pamphlet O'Hareism. Perhaps Fuller and Haggai continued to exchange ideas and think and rethink and write and rewrite. Further letters, uh, have, uh, further letters may have come from O'Hare. There is some reason to think that Haggai, Haggai had some misgivings about the scheme, based on page 20 of Accuser of the Brethren, uh, sometime, sometime may have, sometime, sorry, may have been needed for Fuller to persuade him uh, for the idea to mature and to finalize. But, but it seems like the idea is coming from somewhere in 1937 and 1938, and we're concluding that based upon this letter that O'Hare writes to David Otis Fuller and makes mention of it. And he says specifically in the second paragraph of the letter, 
He says, I'm writing you concerning the article which you have printed in your church bulletin concerning O heretics or hyper dispensationalists as well as several other statements you made concerning me over the radio and in the Grand Rapids paper. Okay? So, the O'Hareism discussion is on, as it were, by 1937-1938 for sure. Okay? And this, this letter from, and again, this indicates a quick response. This does not indicate a Long, a lengthy period of time in between O'Hare being aware of what Fuller's doing and when O'Hare's responding to Fuller. Yeah. Two points. Have you um, looked for the microfiche of the paper and was it the Grand Rapids Press or the Grand Rapids Herald? It was the press. Okay. Um, we, uh, but no, I have not done that. Well, <clears throat> um, the bottom point on page two uh, under 1937 and 38, uh, line 4, 1899, at the very end of December for O'Hare's conversion. I read a pamphlet of his this week that <coughs> November as the date of his conversion, same year. So there's conflict here uh, from O'Hare's own pamphlets themselves. We have to. I don't know that we can resolve it. The, 19th, the, the December date, isn't that coming from his audio recording with Baker? Possibly. That's, we can check that. I think it was. I think December <coughs> 1899 I, was coming my, from that. My reason for putting December in here was that I think he says somewhere, on the last day of 1899, I was converted to Christ, or something like that. Uh, okay. But I can't document that just from my memory. I seem to remember hearing that in the recorded might, you um, might be right, that's word testimony. So, top of page 3, 1939-1940. <coughs> the likely period of publication and distribution of the first undesignated edition of O'Hareism by Fuller. Its cover was printed with red ink on buff cover stock. Later editions are numbered as second edition fourth edition, etc., and the covers of at least some later editions were printed with black ink. On the first cover, Haggai is said to be pastor of Brookville Baptist Church in Massachusetts. The cover also had a note in red ink suggesting O'Hare was refusing to accept an invitation to debate Haggai on baptism. It says right here at the bottom, um, where is it? The, Bap uh, the Baptist minister who challenged uh, Reverend J.C. O'Hare of Chicago to debate this subject, but the challenge was never answered, is the claim that they're putting on the cover of the book. Okay. Nin uh, 1940. Haggai appears in the 1940 U.S. Census as residing in Holbrook, Massachusetts, and pastoring Brook Brookville Baptist Church. Haggai lived about a mile from the church. Now, 19... 42, March, March 1st, 1942. This is where the Judge Fuller booklet is going to come into play. Okay? If you open up this and look on the inside cover, it's, it's clearly dated Chicago, March 1st, 1940, March 1942. Dear Judge Fuller, O'Hare says. So, O'Hare writes a letter to Fuller about O'Hareism, a copy of which he says he has just received. Okay? So if you open this up, it says right here, on the inside of the front cover, I have just received a copy of a message which is being distributed by the pastor of Wealthy Street Baptist Church, or sorry, Wealthy Street Baptist Temple, Grand Rapids, Michigan. So he says, it, he says March 1st, 1942, that he just received a copy of what Fuller is distributing. Okay? The title is obviously Judge, Full, Judge David Otis Fuller Concerning O'Hareism. So he, he says, if you look at, the, starting again with this point, um, O'Hare writes a letter, no, where am I at? That's it. Yeah, O'Hare writes a letter to Fuller about O'Hareism, a copy of which he says he has just received. This can only refer to the first edition, undesignated, of the pamphlet. This letter was published as a pamphlet, Judge David Otis Fuller concerning O'Hareism, uh, but how much later is not clear. It partly concerned the pamphlet's cover note that O'Hare was unwilling to debate Haggai. 
This letter also alludes to a previous letter to the previous letter of 1937 and states, and here's where I added a quote here, your Massachusetts religious pal might be excused on the grounds of ignorance for his ungracious, dishonorable, and malicious accusations. But both you and your official board know full well that I do not teach or believe any of the extreme dispensationalism which I am being charged in your book, O'Hareism. I wrote you at length concerning my teaching some months ago when you were misrepresenting me in your public utterances, and if you had done what any spiritual, honest Christian should have done, you would have publicly apologized for your false and ungracious charges. But you are still maliciously, intentionally falsifying. Unless you have deceived the members of your official board, I cannot understand why they would permit you to continue your untruthful accusations, especially at this time when the world is torn asunder by strife and bloodshed, and when men of God should be united in, in giving forth a clear gospel testimony to millions of hell-bound sinners. So, this, when he talks in there, in, in, in Judge Fuller, dated March 1st, 1942, about having already written lengthy letter to, Ohi to uh, Fuller and the board of his church, this is the letter that I think he's referring to, because it says, right in the, um, now let me find it, which paragraph? I know I included it here somewhere. Hence this open letter, copies of which will be sent to members of your official board, as well as to many preachers and Christian workers. And there's a subtitle on here that says, underneath it, it says, uh, a letter to Reverend David Otis Fuller, Pastor Wealthy Street, uh, Baptist Temple, Grand Rapids, Michigan, copies to William L. William L. Pettingill and and some other misinformed Baptist preachers. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's it's it seems pretty clear that when he writes Judge Fuller in March first, nineteen forty-two, he says that he's just seen a copy of it, and he says that he'd previously written to him and his official board some months earlier. So he doesn't say exactly how long it's been. It's been some length of time. So it's, it's, it's pretty clear that the pamphlet is coming into existence sometime before uh, March 1st, 1942, but after somewhere <coughs> within 1938. So there's a window here, there's a window of about four years that this first appearing fits into at the end of the 30s or beginning of the 40s. O'Hare, uh, last point on page three, O'Hare expresses belief that Fuller thought it would help if he printed on the cover the suggestion that he, O'Hare, feared to publicly debate water baptism with Pastor Haggai, possibly implying there was actually no invitation from Haggai. But in Accuser, page 20, O'Hare also says that he preferred to debate a representative outstanding Bible teacher, a recognized leader among fundamentalists. In other words, he didn't want to mess around with Haggai, according to that at least. This remark also suggested, or also suggests that he received such an invitation, but decided to ignore it, or uh, ignore it, sorry, for the reasons suggested. In Accuser, page 20, O'Hare says, the second edition, i.e. the new edition of O'Hareism, was published more than two years after he sent this letter, which would have been March 1st, 1942. So, in, in Accuser of the Brother, which is from 1945, he says there's a second edition of O'Hareism. All right. He had previously written Fuller about it in March of 1942. All right. So these two sources are critical to establishing what's going. Well, actually, these three are the the, the three key sources from establishing from O'Hare's point of view what's going on here. Okay. So at the end of the letter, O'Hare offers to debate Haggai in any location of, of Haggai and Fuller's choosing in Grand Rapids. If after reading this you decide on a public debate on the whole subject, on a public debate on the whole subject in any building in Grand Rapids, this is my acceptance. Name the time and place. This was this will perhaps bring your friend out of his obscurity and help him to get the recognition of which he craves and is determined to have even if he must defame his fellow Christian to gain it. O'Hara seems a little bit mad. Okay. Um, I don't really 
see how there's any way around that. So now 1944, the second edition of O'Hara's was published and so labeled. So that would have been this one right here that says second edition on it. All right. Um, later in 1944, O'Hara received a copy of this edition, which in turn said nothing about O'Hara's 1942 debate offer, but instead repeated the earlier statement that O'Hara had not accepted the challenge. It seems very unlikely that it took 14 years if the first edition appeared in 1930 for the second edition to appear considering Foley's, Fuller's sorry, likely aggressive promotion. So there's just no way that this came to be in 1930. It's just, it's just not going to work. It doesn't, fit the, it doesn't fit the chronology here that's being established. Okay? 1945, February 24, Haggai writes a letter to O'Hare, later quote an accuser of the brother on page 20, to the effect that Fuller induced him to write O'Hareism, and that Fuller himself published and promoted it. Haggai also said in the letter that he was urged by Fuller to challenge O'Hare to a debate on baptism, apparently by Fuller, as noted above, what happened over this challenge is unclear. So Haggai now writes O'Hare and he says, well, he kind of, he, he, asked me to do this and you know sort of yeah I did it but I didn't really want to do it and he sort of made me do it and you know I, I'm being a little bit sarcastic but I mean that's basically hey guys claiming that the whole thing was Fuller's idea and that he went along with it um, which doesn't really speak very well of hey guy but um, that's that's what he's claiming in this letter to O'Hare from 1945 1945, O'Hare writes accuser of the, uh, the accuser of the brethren uh, and the brethren against Fuller and Haggai. If you look at the cover of accuser, the accuser of the brethren and the brethren concerning Bullingerism, a reply to O. Fuller, Haggai, DeHaan and company. So he's clearly writing the accuser of the brethren in response to this whole controversy with Haggai and, and, uh, and Fuller about O'Hareism. Um, so, the, elsewhere he says he tried to resolve the dispute privately, but without success. So then 1950, Haggai is list, listed in the Binghamton, New York directory as pastor in Calvary Back Baptist Church in Binghamton. 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 Uh, according to Ancestry.com. This is proof that he pastored Brookville Baptist Church in Holbrook, Massachusetts before he pastored in Binghamton, unless, as mentioned above, this was an earlier short pastorate there. The fourth edition of O'Hareism was published at the fourth edition of O'Hareism was published at Binghamton, as the edition says, and as it appears in the WorldCat.org website. So, if I'm understanding you you right there, Doctor Quit, you're saying that the fourth edition lists. Haggai as pastor at the church in New York, not the church in Massachusetts. That's right. Okay. So, let's stop there. Any, any questions or comments before we look at a few more things with respect to this? <coughs> Ashley? On the dating and stuff, uh, uh, several years ago I was teaching at, uh, with uh, Pastor Sadler. And uh, I questioned him because I noticed a lot of the stuff on the internet actually was misquoted and it looked to me deliberately perverted to conform with uh, an opposing opinion. And uh, that prompted me to ask Pastor Sadler if he knew of any of the O'Hare relatives that were still alive to see if if there was any chance of having the O'Hare things, because he's in possession of a lot of that stuff, if somebody should copyright that stuff to prevent or make it illegal to pervert it. Now, I don't know whether that's possible. Some of that stuff, of course, most of that stuff is public domain. But uh, we're foolish if we think that people, even within our stripe uh, <coughs> movement, we're foolish if we think <laughs> they would not deliberately change some of the actual wordings and teachings. You're, you're saying when they reprint the stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. 
So they're, they're, they're having it reprinted and you're saying they're changing some of the words. Well, I don't know what's reprinted. I caught it. I caught it. The discrepancies on the internet as I would read through it. So, of course, uh, people on the internet can, anybody with a computer and a typewriter can change it. So that was, uh, I'm just wondering how, <coughs> you know, I don't know where some of that stuff comes from. And Sadler didn't either. I do know that uh, he made an attempt to contact, or he did contact some of the O'Hare relatives. I don't know what the pro, uh, what the thing was. Anyway, it does have to do with dating. It does have to do uh, with authentic, authenticity. And it's just a comment. I think that needs to be at least considered at times. I, I we I think Dr. Dewitt and I are in agreement that we think that. The, the O'Hare stuff is strewn probably over oh. a thousand basements, yep. you know, all over the country. And whether or not we'll ever have what we could consider to be a 100% complete collection is somewhat, the, I don't know that we can do that unless you can speak to that more clearly. Only this, that a week ago today, Jimmy Stringham, who perhaps I think at least has, with the list together, am I right about that? Mm -hmm. When he was working for you? Yes. That Stringham told me last Sunday mor morning that he was now aiming at an absolute exhaustive list of O'Hare's pamphlets. And so maybe he'll success, succeed with that. I hope he does. That means that more material will be available for other people to work on. Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe, you know, add some things to what we're doing. But I think that's a very good thing. Mm -hmm. I hope he succeeds at it. Or that kind of thing is really hard to do. Then the next thing is to gather all of them together in one collection. Oh, that's, that's, another, major that, that's another major headache. Mike? Well, apparently the, the O'Hareism booklet was still being circulated in the mid-50s because uh, the truth magazine has Dr. Baker writing an article yeah. complaining about uh, O'Hare, well, the O'Hareism booklet, as late as the mid It might even be that the fifth edition, as they called it, was not published until after it. <coughs> and Baker's hopping mad also. It's, it is, it, you never really see, his, see that in his writings, but there it comes out a little bit in that article. Yeah. He's, he's very annoyed, annoyed by it. If you, if you think O'Hare was angry here, you read some of Zwingli or Martin Luther's comments. <laughs> huh? Yeah. And Luther, Luther said he has no, no uh, qualms about using profanity if necessary. <laughs> you should hear what he called the Pope. <laughs> well, I know what he called him. I've seen the cartoon. Anyway, um, let's do the compelling evidence now at the bottom of page four. So. Three comments by O'Hare, an accuser of the brethren from 45, seem to offer compelling evidence of a date for O'Hareism by Haggai of about 1939 or 1940 within the context of the preceding chronology rather than the date of 1930 shown on some database websites. I personally have it in, in parentheses here. I favor myself 40 or 41. And the reason I favor that is given O'Hare's statements on the inside cover of his dated letter to David Otis Fuller on March 1st, 1941. On the inside, O'Hare states, as I just said, I have just received a copy of the message which is being distributed by the pastor of Wealthy Street. Now, I'm just reasoning there myself that if I, I don't see there be, having been a, a very big uh, gap in time before O'Hare probably is notified or sent a copy of this from somebody in Grand Rapids about what's going on. So I, I favor uh, 40 or 41. Dr. DeWitt favors 39 or 40. Really, the, the bottom line is it has to be before March 1st, 1942, okay? But here's the first quote. Pastor Haggai's work was malicious and vicious. And at that time, he is less guilty than Pastor Fuller. For I had written him in detail before this pamphlet was printed that I did not teach, endorse, or condone doctrines which he publicly, falsely accused me of teaching before he encouraged Pastor Haggai to put them in print. So I take that, I personally take that to be a reference again to this letter from 37 38. 
The comment refers to a prior letter or letters to Fuller before the first edition of O'Hareism. One letter we know of was a letter to Reverend David Otis Fuller, which is the one I just showed you, which was printed and circulated publicly at the same time or shortly after it was sent privately. It, it, uh, it is dated 1937 by O'Hare's reference uh, in his uh, con reference in, uh, it. in it to his conversion as having occurred 37 years earlier at the end of December 1899 by his own testimony. On page 20 of Accuser of the Brother, O'Hare uh, says further of Fuller, number two, he knew that I had written him and several members of his official board that I did not teach or believe most of the doctrines that he included in his, in his public addresses which he gave on O'Hareism. Which is again exactly what this letter is addressing as I just read to you a few moments ago. This comment is more specific than the earlier letter which was written uh, to Fuller and members of his board after Fuller's speeches on O'Hareism. The first page of a letter to Reverend David Otis Fuller contains the following statement. Hence this open letter, copies of which will be sent to the members of your official board, as well as to many preachers and Christian workers. And on page 27 of Accuser of the Brethren, O'Hare writes, Let me repeat that I explained fully to Dr. Fuller long before he hired Haggai to falsify for him. So this is another reference to the letter. <coughs> the long before suggests some time lapse. How long cannot be determined exactly. More, Im more importantly, quotes 1 and 3 above show that Haggai's pamphlet was the end point of some form of development of Fuller's public speeches against O'Hareism. So in other words, what you see in print is sort of the final manifestation of what Fuller started from his pulpit and also in print in the Grand Rapids press, press and on the radio uh, criticizing O'Hare. Hence it appears that the O'Hareism talk or service was a new stage in the controversies of the 1930s and early 1940s, initiated not by Haggai's pamphlet in 1930, but by Fuller's public speech or sermons, which were in turn later given extension and wider publication by Fuller through inducing Haggai to write them in a pamphlet under his own name. So, as O'Hare recognizes on page 20 of Accuser of the Brethren, Haggai was really a secondary player in the process, with Fuller as the primary mover and initiator, and Haggai as Fuller's pamphlet spokesman. This set of comments, along with the one below, points conclusively to the origin of O'Hareism within the framework of 1937-1941. Finally, also an accuser of the brother in page 20, O'Hare quotes from a letter of Haggai to himself <coughs> about the, the pamphlet as follows. As to my booklet, that was urged upon me. <coughs> Dr. Fuller besought me to prepare it. He published it. I didn't. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, so any, yeah. Um, listening to this, which you've just summarized, I wonder if the original 80 page was the transcript of his sermon. Um, you mean from 1929? Yes. Uh, I, I certainly am not prepared to say that's incorrect because ultimately I don't know. But it does not read, because I just looked at it again this week and it doesn't read like it's a transcript or notes. It, it reads like a book. Well, um, but some people before they preach, pastors that I've worked under, actually write it out the way they intend to say it. And it might be written just as well as, you know, and then well, others use notes and what they speak is... We've actually discussed this, the possibility that somebody may have been taking O'Hare's... It, it seems... We have, I think we're in agreement on this, right, Dr. DeWitt, that there seemed to be, if you count everything, somewhere in the neighborhood of 300, everything from book -like, books like this, the little teeny booklets that O'Hare, um, far more than, you know, had, would previously would have been thought, okay? And so, and, and there's, there's weird things, like in that stack of stuff I got from Pastor Jordan from Paul Franzen uh, in May, 
there's, it's, there's mimeographed messages that look as though they were what transcripts from a radio broadcast or something that had been typed out. So I don't want to say more than, I, than, than we know, but there, you know, one of the things, I've had a thought for a while that O'Hare may have been having help with some of this from a secretary or somebody that was, you know, taking the audio, some of the audio sermons and, you know, transcribing them into written form. So maybe that's true, but again, it's speculation. Well, what I'm saying is that I worked for one lady pastor who was more of a writer than what she is a speaker, but she's very brilliant, and she would write it out as though it were a blog, and then memorize it to such an extent that when she delivered it, it sounded fresh, but it was word for word what she had previously written. Ultimately, I'd say we don't know. Uh, maybe that happened, maybe it didn't, I'm not sure. <clears throat> what, I, what I do know and what still puzzles me is, number one, why did he rewrite the great blunder of the church? Number two, given when he rewrote it, and when these guys write this, why are they still using the old edition for their quotes and not the new one, other than maybe they weren't aware of it? Or it may still be the case that when O'Hare became aware of the radio attacks and the pulpit attacks and the attacks in the Grand Rapids Press, that he was also aware of the fact that his book was being quoted and he still might have reworked it um, as a result of this. Whether we know for sure, I don't think we'll ever know. Just things to think about, yeah. Well, you know how I am with history. But you love it. Yeah, okay. Um, in the second bullet point, on page three, or page five, I'm sorry, yep. where you say, initiated not by Haggai's pamphlet in 1930. The 1930, is that the date we're setting now? No, I no. thought we debunked that. No, we're saying or, that. I misunderstand. We're saying the stream here. of, the stream of um, oh. argument, is, if you will, did not begin in 1930. It began sometime in the latter half of the 1930s. Okay. Well, the whole force of this argument is the pamphlet didn't even exist right. until about 1940. Right. So that, and then the conclusion is that 1930 is simply wrong, period. It's got to be wrong. So uh, let me just give you my concluding thoughts and then we'll um, take any final questions or comments. And there is a, I don't know what was going on, a typo there in this first point, but even though the Grace History Project was wrong, about the initial publication date for O'Hareism, our initial mistake was fortunate in the sense that it led to learning that there were two editions of the great blunder of the church. If I hadn't made that mistake, we probably would not know that there are two editions of the great blunder of the church. Okay, it's, I'm admitting that it's a mistake, but it's a mistake that at least led to some, some, something profitable. Okay. Uh, second, Dr. DeWitt has reached out to Adam Christmas regarding the dating errors exhibited in his thesis and to date has received no evidence that Christmas is willing to amend his dates or as per, uh, amend his dates as per our findings. In the meantime, Christmas has furnished no evidence to corroborate his date of 1930 for the publication of O'Hareism. Um, and I would suggest to you that there are many dates in his bibliography <coughs> that are probably gleaned in similar manner from Google Books or websites for which probably they're wrong uh, based on what we now know. So we have, we, I say Dr. DeWitt, has reached out to him on this in email and uh, he has not responded. So before concluding this lesson, it is important to point out that by 1945, with the publication of Accuser of the Brethren, O'Hare had altered his position somewhat on when the church began. Please recall that his first position in God's Reign of Grace for the Human Race, which is between July 1937 and April 1938, was that the church began before Paul wrote, wrote Romans. This was also the position of the Worldwide Grace Testimony when it was founded in January 1939. In 1945, as part of his defense against Fuller and Haggai, O'Hare states the following on the origin of the church. Quote, When Fuller and Haggai printed that I teach, 
that the prison epistles alone are for this dispensation, they printed that which is not true. Dr. Fuller knew it was untrue when the pamphlet was printed, and I am quite sure that Mr. Haggai knew it. I believe that this age of grace and the body of this dispensation began before Paul wrote his first epistle. Now you see that's different. Slightly. He says before Romans, here he's saying before Paul writes his first what? Now I know there's debate about whether 1 Thessalonians or Galatians was written first, but now he's, so if, if we use, a, I believe a lot of people think that Romans was written somewhere around Acts 20. Well, if, and, and Galatians and, and 1 Thessalonians would have been written before that, he's, he's moving back further towards the middle uh, of the book with that statement. At least that's, that's the way it appears to me. And then he finishes that quote by saying, It is absurd to call the church at Corinth, or at Philippi, or at Ephesus, or at Thessalonica, a kingdom church. I have stood against such fantastic teachings as uncompromisingly and aggressively as I have preached against uh, Dr. Fuller's and Pastor uh, Haggai's unscriptural watery grave witness. So, any thoughts, conclusions, any questions, anything? So, for the good of the order, hopefully we consider the, the, the chronology with respect to O'Hara's was sufficiently corrected um, for purposes of you know accuracy and completeness. So does anybody have anything they want to bring up, add, discuss? We've got about four minutes, Ronnie. I would suggest reading the, the article that was in the press. It, it may have some other... Have you seen it? No, no, I'm just asking if no, I think anybody it, looked at it. A bit of neglect on Brian and my part both, that we should be, we should chase that article in the press, or uh, probably a series of articles. See if we can find maybe, it. Maybe, yeah. <coughs> I have a question for Dr. DeWitt. What, regarding the two editions of uh, The Great Blunder, um, we know in his later years he sent his, his writings up to be printed at commercial printers, but uh, Mr. Rich told me that also, so he himself had typeset material or uh, equipment in his home, home or church, and he would often uh, type out the, the uh, lead type, the old fashioned lead type type. Uh, Ray Rich told you that he knew that? Yes, they knew that, and and then he would he would print a, a run of booklets and then melt melt the lead type back down, or whatever they did, how the technology was, and reuse the stuff. So if he did what, it seems that booklet is too big for the average guy to to do that in his home or or, but but if he did it, that might he may have regretted uh, and. Uh, with the first edition, just did the whole thing over again later on, and it came out a little different. I don't know if this is your point, but I think it's extremely likely that O'Hare typed his own manuscripts. He had a business. He had a business degree. Oh, but could he do a book a booklet as big as the Great Blunder? It is. I think you. I think so. I don't because he could have destroyed the type and then went back and then, oh, we need another another edition of this and just. It didn't come out quite the same way, or something. I, I know it's speculative, but yeah, I don't know. But Mr. Rich told me that he used to do that. Just, uh, well, print them and then melt. Use well, the, use the same book well, very well. Use the same lead over you know, to make the uh, next, next booklet. Do you know Ray Rich was my father-in-law? Oh no, I didn't. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I mean his daughter. Lee knows that. Yeah, that way. Yeah. Yes, Ronnie. Um, well, Mike's hypothesis, I, 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 I like it. I like it not just because Mike is my husband, but because no, it, 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 it imputes different motives to O'Hare in rewriting it, other than something to make it come out different originally well, because maybe, of the tax. It's a possibility. The one, thing I'll, the one thing I'll add to that, though, is there's other... Like, there's another matter with the title, The Unsearchable Riches of Christ, that we cannot figure out. There's a magazine edition, there's two magazine editions of that bear that title that he used that um, are completely different and have up to, what is it, six or seven hundred Bible questions and answers in them. Then there's a, another, a, a third one that has like 300 questions in it. 
And then there's the, the, the book that he wrote that he's most famous for, The Unsearchable Riches of Christ, that's nothing like the other things. There's also evidence that he's reusing titles later on. Uh, in, in the early 30s, he wrote a booklet called Messages of Grace and Eternal Life. Well, then in the 40s, 1944, he prints a newspaper, and, and I should have brought it in, I wasn't anticipating this question, but I have it at home, a newspaper size thing with like 50 or 60 pages in it full of articles that he wrote called Messages of Grace and Eternal Life that's completely different from the one that he wrote, you know, 10 years earlier. So there's a lot of curious things that he's doing. It seems like he would fall, sort of fall in love with a particular title and then just reuse it um, at various points without any connection to the other, the other books that he wrote that, that have similar titles. So there's a lot of things that are just sort of weird that we can't figure out. Yeah. If I had to make a judgment, I think if anything, after reading all, reading so many of Moyer's pamphlets and writing about them, that I, my my confidence in his personal integrity has grown. Uh, I think the man had great great integrity, and I doubt that he contrived anything uh, personally. Uh, but what Brian is saying is illustrated in even a case like. Uh, his one of his larger early booklets, The Christian Life, which I believe also underwent revisions, and there was a 1920s edition, and then there was a mid-1930s edition that was much larger, which became the final one that was reprinted over and over. So I think a better hypothesis, Mike, if you don't mind me saying, might be that O'Hare just kept revising and kept work, reworking the material, until he got it the way he wanted it, and it, in my view, it's very likely that he did most of that typing himself. No kidding. Wow. That's, uh, that's what I think. Wasn't that like a I cannot prove that. Uh -huh. The fact that he would change the title on it, it was uh, a, a popular ploy of preachers like myself. I get into a church and suddenly realize I preached that sermon before, so I changed the title. <laughs> <laughs> I changed the title, and most people never recognize it, which means they weren't listening in the first place. <laughs> That's never good, Lee. We, we, I appreciate your uh, your attention. We thank Dr. Witt for being here, but we do got to quit so that I have time to set up for uh, for the main service. So we'll be back in this room next week at nine o'clock.